reading this morning can be found on page 1089. I'm reading from John's Gospel, chapter 20, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in, the book, in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father God, we just want to lift up Bob to you now. We just thank you for him. Thank you that he was willing to come and open up your word for us today. Mm. We just pray that he will be blessed as he Mm. um, speaks it out to us. Mm. And Lord, help us to respond um, Mm. in a positive way to it this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bless you. It's the evening of the first day, the resurrection day, and there is confusion and fear. Um, the, f- the four Gospels that refer to this, uh, these circumstances, and uh, we can see that um, various people have got various opinions, if you like, and some are overjoyed and some are in real fear. And we don't expect really the, the, the uh, disciples, the apostles, to be in that situation of fear, but they were. Perhaps it's their human nature coming out, I'm sure it is. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jews... But quickly, this was replaced by conviction and joy. Jesus came that moment and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Those few words says it, say it all for them at that moment. And I'm sure their spirits were immediately lifted high. Peace be with you. That's what he says to them and that's what he says to us. Peace 
be with you. He says it again in a few moments. But he then showed him his hands and his side. He wanted them to know fully that he was a crucified Lord. And the consequences and the detail of that, as he had explained to them, and they resented it previously and said, no, you're our hero, you can't go and die, you can leave us. But the importance of the crucified marks were there for a very special reason which he comes to in, again and again during the 40-odd days of his appearances. The, the disciples, were, were told now, were overjoyed when they saw the Lord at this moment. So everything was gone. The fear had gone and the confusion. We know that uh, John and Peter, when they arrived at the tomb, wondered why, how on earth the big heavy stone had been removed. And we're told in Matthew's Gospel that uh, an angel came down in gleaming white. Um, Thine be the glory uh, reflects that in that, that hymn and removed the stone. And uh, the, the folded grave clothes were, clothes were there and the hat neatly put there. Anyway, back to the evening, they again, Jesus said, as if to emphasize this peace, peace be with you. Now, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This is a commission to them. The commission had to be introduced with... And with that, I am sending you, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They needed to be equipped to, to uh, evangelize and to go out into all the world, starting at Jerusalem and, and uh, in that area and to the very ends of the earth. And then he says this verse which... For some time, I uh, couldn't quite see the full depth of it, but I certainly can now looking at various commentaries. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This was stated immediately after giving them the Holy Spirit and the display of his, his resurrection and that the commission was that the... The Christ was to be crucified for our sins. That statement is relative to that. Not to us individuals, although certainly it does apply in, in a great sense. But at this moment, that was the commission that they were to have. And uh, if you read in some of the older translations, you, it becomes more obvious that that was re relative to, to, to the commission for them, the centre of their commission was that the man God in Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world throughout all of history. And I think we need to get that new thing established. He died for you, he died for me, he died for generations past and generations future, however long that will be. And we've uh, sung and prayed this morning and I guess... You know, friends, you wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't have some understanding of that, I'm sure. But it is the centre of our Christianity. And if ever you get the chance to talk about uh, your faith, that is it, that we are going into the kingdom of God. But we can't go in there without the Holy Spirit, as we shall see. Now, what is very interesting, if we go to the beginning of the creation in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we hear this. This is before the fall, by the way. This is when God created male and female. 
particularly male first, if you like, and then subsequently, very quickly, the, the female. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the creation, after he'd made the creation and all that was within it, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. It's very relative. In most Bibles that have commentary, that they always refer to John chapter 20, verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, one of its greatest features is life. And if we look at John 1, <coughs> in the introduction of the Word became flesh, verses 3 and 4 says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. So by receiving the Holy Spirit, we receive that life, that new life, that born-again life. And it becomes our light. And who is our light? The light of the world, the Lord Jesus I would like to do to. There's many references to this uh, action of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But when Jesus started his ministry in the three synoptic Gospels, you will see that he proclaims a simple statement the kingdom of God is at hand, is available. The kingdom of God. Now, we're outside of the kingdom of God. We're in the fallen state. Every human being. And he proclaimed that there is a kingdom and that we may enter it and go back into it, if you like, but I paraphrase it. And I'm sure that every Christian who understands that rejoices in that fact that one day, sooner or later, we'll be back in the kingdom of God. But you know, friends, the religion, a lot of religious people don't understand that in its fullness. And if we go to John chapter 3, a particular man named Nicodemus, who was a highly esteemed member of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin, that means 70 people who... who who controlled politically under the Romans uh, the, the, uh, the religious life and uh, they got involved in the taxes as long as they paid so much to Rome. Uh, they were quite, the Romans were quite... The Romans were actually very cute in, in expanding their empire because they handed a lot of stuff to the countries they went to, the political stuff, but they kept a grip, especially on the tax system, but they got to uh, cooperation because they, uh, they didn't dominate and the people t too much. And uh, Nicodemus, uh, incidentally, Joseph of Arimathea, who comes in later, uh, was also uh, a prominent member of the Jewish ruling council. They both became Christians, if you, if you read right through the end of the Gospels. But at this moment, he was a very... Uh, orthodox religious leader. Now Jesus, at this point of his ministry, was gathering huge crowds. If you look at the map of the land, there's uh, Nazareth in the north, uh, Samaria in the centre, a bit like the three counties, and Jude Judea at the bottom. That covered the whole area of Palestine. 
of course, uh, Israel had gone hundreds of years into uh, was uh, was taken into Assyria and uh, lost. Really, I'm sure there was people going backwards and forwards like they do with refugees, etc. But if you look at the the statements of those three big areas, people came flooded because of the miracles. You know, people like to be healed, don't they? And so on, and see this wonderful man. I'm sure that was mostly in their minds. But it was also, quite interestingly, beyond the Jordan. Now, the Sea of Galilee was in the north, the Dead Sea was in the south, and uh, the River Jordan flowed in between. And it says in the Bible several times, these vast crowds came from beyond the Jordan. I think it's a place, uh, the area is called Decapolis, Decapolis which is, means ten cities. People came flooding from that area. This sent alarm bells ringing within the Jewish <laughs> council. And Nicodemus is seen as a very diplomatic and nice, good politician to be able to sort it out. And so... He comes at night incognito to see Jesus. And I'm sure he had in mind, if we can get this guy on our side, we'll have scored a real feather in our cap. We could make him secretary or ministry, a minister of religion. This would be a really great thing. It, it resonates if you, read the, if you read the narrative in John chapter 3. Now, there was a man of of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, nice title you see he's introducing. We know, we know, who, are, who is we? The whole council. We know you are, a t you are a teacher who has come from God. Now you would think that Jesus would really respond to this and say, right, sit down, let's have a talk about this. Yes, you agree, I've come from God and I'm a good teacher. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. Thank you, Nicodemus. Great, thank you. Let's have a talk about religion. Lots of people like to talk about religion throughout history. People like to discuss it, and especially in these days and ages, I think. Strange, isn't it? but they don't talk about the grace of God, salvation. They talk about being religious. They might touch on it and then say, well, it could be this, it could be that. Jesus was not going to have a religious discussion with Nicodemus. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God Unless he is born again. What does that mean? Nicodemus immediately was turned. And um, he, re he replies, How can a man be born, born again when he's old? Don't be silly, Jesus. Nicodemus asked, Surely he, sorry, Nicodemus asks, yes, to Jesus, surely he cannot enter the, a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Really hands-on stuff, isn't it? And it's good it's here because it explains a lot. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Now there's a reference here to the water which is a reference to the physical birth as uh, um, Nicodemus has stated and Jesus picks that up and says unless, and in a way there's a deeper meaning to this if we're born we qualify for this. That's, that's how we qualify. We have to be a human being. Religion may come to us. I'm sure the, the 
practices of the various denominations and churches are wonderful and good. But our quali qualification is to be human, to be born. That's what the Lord is saying. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows, where, and he's giving him a lovely graphic uh, 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 sign here of the Spirit in human terms, if you like, before the... The reality comes into the lives and hearts and minds and souls of people. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? I can't explain it, but I can experience it. I should rephrase that. We can't explain it, but we can experience it. And that experience comes in many, many ways. It's come to me many times, and I'm certainly not perfect, friends, but I, ha I know because I believe and trust in him, I do have that. And there are times when I say, Lord, where are you? Why, why aren't you doing something about this, what I've prayed about happens? But you know, friends, something always does. If, it only, if it's only peace that I get from that situation, it's an experience can't come from anywhere else. I could read the Bible back to front and upside down, take it all on board. But unless I say yes, Lord, to him, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, I do believe you and trust you. And do you know what, friends? I'm retired now, and of course, I, all my life, um, now I say, I, I, this is something I've always wanted. I didn't know it, but it's something that I, I always wanted. It's a little personal testimony there. When that statement comes, the wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked? Jesus says, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. You do not understand these things, so I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have been, we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. On that last piece, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Obviously, the lifting up of the Son of Man was on the cross, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And if you look at that incident in Numbers 20, verses 4 to 9, it's very strange, really, that this was during the, ex the, ex the exodus, and there was a period, lots of things were happening, but there was a period when they weren't going, went through a certain desert where there was lots of snake, poisonous snakes, and they were being bitten, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, and they were dying. And I guess there was children there, etc., so he went to Moses. He was the leader. He could sort things out. And Moses prayed to God. And God said, make a snake and lift it up on a pole, a bronze snake apparently. And all who will believe, who looks at it, will be healed. As the snake, as the No one is the son of man, uh, just as Moses, I'm finding my verse here, friends, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the son of man must be lifted up, lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. 
And that incident where people were dying for the want, God instructed Moses in a very peculiar way. If this had been a human thing, it would have been, well, go and get rid of the snakes or make some oil or something and try it. But he said, no, lift up, lift it up. And everyone who looks and trusts me and believes me will be healed. It's very strange how God works, isn't it? Sometimes he does it in the most peculiar ways. It's all coming down to this two action. One, believe with confession and faith. And the other is that he will come to us. We can't explain it, we can't see it, but we can experience it within our lives. And that's the only message that comes out, really, of Easter. The main message, that he is alive, that he is. And when you get up tomorrow morning, Monday, and you're going off and I'm doing various things and we've got a busy week, perhaps, it's still there with us wherever we go, wherever we drive, wherever we walk, wherever we go. Because he is life. I've just finished with that saying, 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The importance of the spirit taught to Nicodemus had its effect as we see later on in John 3, 1 and John 7, 50, he defended Jesus when the Jews arrested Jesus and said, right, we'll crucify him. He said, hang on a minute. He said, don't, don't we, aren't we uh, civilised? Don't we uh, give a man a, 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 um, a fair trial? He defended Jesus. Of course, he was overruled, but he defended Jesus at that moment. And then, of course, in John 19, 39, we see that he was involved in, um, in the uh, fact that he and, Nicod and Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man who had a special tomb, who gave it for Jesus to be laid there, these two men, these two ruling council uh, Jewish religious people were there at that time and it's obvious that they knew that Jesus was the Messiah at that point. There's just one other little point I'd like to say that, of course, this was that Jesus was crucified at the Passover. That's a very strange thing because Passover was where the angel of death came over the people and they had to put the blood on the door frames and then the children were, who were, who were uh, at, at risk uh, were, were saved and uh, so Jesus being crucified at the Passover has its significance in the Old Testament in Exodus particularly but also um, the spirit came at uh, Pentecost which was approximately well, was 50 days after the Passover and uh, they were all together in one room, it says. Uh, I think there was, uh, it said that they th they think there could be between one and two hundred people who were believers when the, the wind and the fire came. Some of the people say it's the birthday of the church. Wouldn't argue with that. But the spirit has been available from the day we were created by God in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, right through the Spirit, the, the Spirit of God. It's called the Holy Spirit. You call it Holy Ghost, if you like. But it's the Spirit of God has been available from the time man and woman were created by God and he breathed life into them. The problem is we neglect it and have done throughout the ages. Not all. And thank God for the, all the patriarchs and all the wonderful men and women of the Old Testament 
fantastic. And since then, there's still great people. We can name many of them, can't we? Great people, servants of God. But he's looking for the world. For God's, this verse comes out just a moment after talking. For God so loved the world, he's saying this to Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. There are lots of people say that's the greatest statement in the Bible. I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree, but there's many, many, many statements that back that up and, and comply with that, friends. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son for you and for me that we should not perish, but we should have eternal life. Hallelujah, friends. Amen. Bless you.